I could have uh, thanked the organizers for inviting me, but this is r really not true because I invited myself. Because I thought these snails actually have a place here on a conference like this. So I'll send around my two ecotypes of snails. You can have a look while I'm talking. So we're now on the Swedish west coast. It looks like this, that the place where I do most of my research. Uh, I can't really see the screen there. Is it on? This, this is only black. Oh, nevertheless, before I start to say anything more, I will actually acknowledge this guy, Roger Butlin, he's in the audience as well. And much of the work I've done the past 15 or maybe 20 years is actually together with Roger. And I would say in many places also led by Roger. I used to say that I, I'm uh, driving the boat and Roger is doing the thinking. But nevertheless, we teamed up and it's quite amazing actually what you can learn from a place like this. Because we are interested in the same questions as Dorf and many others. How does reproductive isolation evolve? How can barriers to gene flow evolve, even without isolation, perhaps? We'll talk about that a bit later. And from where comes the genetic variation, and how is it organized? So, inspired, of course, by, by the very impressive work by, by Dolph and colleagues, and also thinking about this quite obvious thing that if you're looking after processes that are deterministic like natural selection of course parallel systems is excellent because you can immediately rule out that if the same thing happens in ind independent populations but replicate times you can be sure that there is something deterministic back for example natural selection and this goes both for parallel evolution of course but also for parallel speciation where you have evolution of reproductive barriers also, of course, to, to really understand where comes, from where comes the genetic variation and also how this variation can be structured is inspired by much of the work done in the stickleback system. Uh, so the background for ecological speciation and the understanding of the role of standing genetic variation is, of course, very general that you can learn from this system. So if we now switch to the snail system, of course, you, you can be struck at once when you see this species, Litrina saxatlis, that it's enormously polymorphic in phenotype. So these are all adult individuals. And you can see the size range, but you can also see many other features that are quite variable. But you can still, in principle, cross all of them, and you can get fertile offspring that are quite happy, at least in the lab, and some places also in nature. But there is, of course, something going on here as well. And the story is more complex than just a, a very big homogeneous gene pool, of course. If we return to the Swedish West Coast, you can see here in this photo that you have two very different environments. You have the rock surface out there in the back where the wave action is really fierce. But in the close beach here, you have the boulders, and behind and underneath the boulders, the wave action is much less. But instead, you have crab predation in that area. So if you go and look very clearly, very closely here, you can see that the snails on the rock surface, they dwell in the crevices. In the boulder shore, they sit on top of the boulders, on side the boulders. And they are for surely adapted then to these different environments. So we have the wave snails, the one in, in the one container that is going around, the small ones. They have a very thin shell, they are small and they are very bold actually coming out uh, very quickly from the shell because they have to hang on to the, sh to the cliffs. And then we have the crab snails that are really adapted. You need a hammer to cross them. They are strong and robust, but they're also very shy. They don't want to be outside because then they risk the crab to, to, to grab the soft parts. But interestingly enough, this species is also not really so what, what most marine species are. It's not really broadcasting its larvae, but it has a direct development. So all the development takes place inside the female pouch and out come small miniature snails. And this is, of course, something that is very important for the local adaptation here, that they have a very low, 
low dispersal. They live more or less within the same square meter throughout their life. In the contact zone between these two environments, you find actually a, a, a gradient of phenotypes. So there's a transition. We used to call it a contact zone or a hybrid zone. And you can see already from the phenotype that there is a transition from one ecotype to the other. And of course, it has been interesting to try to understand what's go going on there. So the first thing we did some years ago now was actually with microsatellites to try to find out how much of gene flow is passing over this contact zone. And if you then compare the gene flow within over 30 meters within the in the crab ecotype, which is almost like a full gene flow, it's not really a subdivision there. You can say that in the wave ecotype, on the other side, you have a little bit of a restricted gene flow, relatively, because they live in, in crevices and they are really stuck in their crevices. But you can see that over the hybrid zone, there's something going on. So the gene flow immediately drops very, very dramatically. And of course, this can be due to different processes. It can be due to that the hybrids that are formed in the hybrid zone are for, for in some way not, not uh, really so fit and they have incompatibilities between the two genotypes. It can be due to assortative mating. It can be due to local adaptation. We don't think it's due to isolation by distance because then you would see this also within the pure habitats. So trying to approach this as a first approximation, you could say, we actually looked for hybrid signals of hybrid incompatibilities. And what you can observe is that many of the females actually have quite high proportions of abortive embryos. And you can easily tell that from dissecting a female and picking out the embryos. You can see weird looking embryos while they should look like this instead. And we thought that maybe in the hybrid zone, you will have an increased uh, uh, proportion of these uh, abortive embryos, but this is not the case. So this is data from three different uh, hybrid zones. And you can see that's barely any pattern at all. There's a lot of variation between individuals and between samples, but not really. So from pure ecotypes, uh, wave ecotype to pure crab ecotype, there is more or less no differences at all. And the hybrids in the middle here is definitely not more uh, with higher proportions than the others. So nothing there. And this is, of course, interesting because if you, if, if you imagine that the two ecotypes would have been isolated for a long while, you would maybe perhaps see that there are some signals of incompatibilities when you crossbreed them. What about mating, assortative mating? Well, in, in lab experiments, you can easily show actually that there is a size assortative mating, which is quite strong. So when they are mating, the female is climbing onto a rock and the male is climbing on the side of the female uh, and insert the, the penis here under the shell. And of course, if the male is huge compared to the female, which is in this part of the graph, the probability of mating goes down because it doesn't work functionally, mechanistically. The other way around, if the male is very small compared to the female, then it will not work either. So the probability of mating also goes down here. The optimal uh, size rela relationship is when the female is a little bit larger than the male, but not uh, huge. And as you see from the shells that are going around here, they have very different sizes. So the wave ecotype is almost less than half the size, a third of the size of the crab ecotype. So there can be something going on here. But on the other hand, modeling this and also considering that the size variation over the hybrid zone is continuously going from large size to small size, the assortative mating may not have such a strong effect, but some barrier effect is probably coming from this part. But there is, of course, something else here, which uh, I already very, very many years ago as a young student uh, uh, found out, and that was by transplant experiment. If you move them from their own habitat to the opposite habitat, you can see that the survival will actually go down a lot. So the crab ecotype have only a 10% survival rate compared to the wave ecotype in the wave environment, and then the opposite in the other. And this is, of course, what you expect looking at their differences and all their adaptations. So local adaptation here is creating very strong barriers to gene flow. This is quite obvious. Well, 
now, as I pointed out, there are lots of differences here between the, the, the two ecotypes. The phenotypic difference is not only in shape and size, but also in physiological parameters. We haven't measured that a lot, but we have a few. And in color, in, in behavior, etc. So there's a, tons of differences between them. And a, a much more detailed analysis now, uh, led by Roger, we have, we have been do doing that over the past uh, five, six, seven years, something. Uh, taking samples throughout the hybrid zone, very intense, several hundred snails, positioning the samples exactly on spot, measuring the environment, measuring the genotype of the individuals and the phenotype of the individuals. So making a hybrid zone analysis in details. And this has been done in, in replicate uh, transects, but I'll show a, a few examples here of what it looked like. So if you pass then from one end of the transect, for example, the crab side here, and then over the contact zone, over to the wave side, you will see that a lot of these phenotypic traits will change. Size, shape, color is illustrated in this graph. And they all change here where the environment uh, change. So these uh, vertical lines indicate different changes in, or ab abrupt changes in the environment. But you can also see that there are lots of SNPs, alleles, that change exactly in this spot. So actually, we found throughout the genome by, by uh, genome-wide uh, sequencing something in the in the magnitude of 2,000 SNPs that changed on this exact hybrid zone center. And of course, you can start to think about what's going on here in the genome. What is the architecture behind these differences? We know uh, for, for a long time ago that we have 17 chromosomes pairs. And if we map these differences in the allele frequencies on these 17 chromosomes, it ends up that th uh, three of the chromosomes are standing out here. It's chromosome 6, 14, and 17. And as we already heard today, if you have such a pattern, and in particular if you see that the differences are found uh, in a piece of, a, of the chromosome while the rest of the chromosome is more or less undifferentiated, you can be a bit suspicious about inversions. And we have built on this data and actually confirmed that, that there are inversions involved. And as already Andrew and others ha has pointed out, if you have an inversion, you have an internal barrier to gene flow. So you immediately isolate the two genomes from exchanging and recombining genes over those pieces of the chromosome. So it acts like a super gene. Now, in the snails, we have found something in the range of 10, maybe 11, 12 inversions that actually are important, and they all show these clients. But there's still one thing that is fascinating, and that is that even if the inversions change their frequency quite dramatically, many of them, they rarely go to fixation in one end or the other. So they remain polymorphic in the ends of the transaction, transects here. And I'll come back to that a little bit in the end of this talk. What about the phenotypic traits? Well, by QTL mapping, we have actually been able to at least locate some of the traits to different parts of the, ge of the genome. And many of the, the, the peaks here that you find are actually again hitting these three chromosomes, 6, 14, and 17. So size, for example, the QTL for size is quite heavily loaded on, on the, uh, the inversion on chromosome 6. Shape a little bit more distributed here on, on the chromosome 17. Aperture color the same. Six has another chromosome here, chromosome 12, which is the most, uh, seem to be the most important. But I will not talk about sex now because it turned out to be quite complicated uh, and there are more chromosomes and inversions involved in that we know now. Okay, so this is the situation in Sweden. What, uh, what about other areas? We have studied this system also in UK and France, and you find the same subdivision here in a crab ecotype and a wave ecotype. We also studied in Spain, and similar there, although they look a little bit different, we have a, a clear subdivision in a crab and a wave ecotype. Uh, 
And although the environments are a little bit different in one way, it's still crabs that are important and wave action that are important, even if the distribution of the ecotypes are a bit different. We have still these two major selective agencies to, to play around with. So what's going on here? Well, to make a long story short, we are actually by genomic and also, also uh, uh, analysis of, of the genome, but also analyzing the demographic history, have quite strong support for a true parallel evolution case here. So the Spanish system is quite isolated actually from from the rest of the European system. It's actually so much isolated that if you put in a third species here, it ends up here between. So th there's another species in between here. Don't ask me why or how, but this is one of the interesting, fascinating things. So the Spanish system is very, very independent from the other two. The other two is also, we say, locally evolved. So this has happened within the UK and this has happened within the Swedish system. We can also see within countries that we have this parallelism uh, going on. And what is then interesting, of course, is to see what, how much of this variation that we find in the genome is actually unique for the different places, how much is shared among the different areas. So here is a study that done by, by a, a postdoc, Hernan Morales, a few years ago, where we mapped on, on the linkage groups here, on the chromosomes here, we mapped with different colors the uh, SNPs that were shared among all the 11 places that we sampled. So if it's uh, densely red, you have a lot of sharing, which means, for example, all of these SNPs on the, in the inversion of linkage group 6 is more or less shared throughout the Europe while in other places you have sharing among some of the lo localities, but not all of the localities or countries. But it seems like at least those, that variation that is inside the inversions is to some extent shared, while the variation that is in the collinear part that is outside the inversions are shared, but to a lower, lower degree. So there is Inversions, they are presumably old, as in the stickleback case. We don't know from where they come or how long they have been around exactly, but we can see that they are shared over the whole European system. And that in itself means that it, they must be quite old. So in particular, this uh, linkage group 6 and, and 14, for example. Now, there's another thing that makes this system a bit interesting, that Already a long time ago, we experienced when we analyzed the proteins, allozymes, that there is, in addition to this crab wave axis of environmental variation, there is also a vertical axis of environmental variation. Because if you go on, on, a, on a shore, you can, be sure, you can be sure that if you sit high up on the shore, there will be much warmer, much less wave spray, and of course in the winter much colder, whilst if you sit submerged under the water, you will be in a much more stable climate all the time. So there is a fantastic uh, gradient there for not least physiological to tolerance. And this is seen clearly in this aspartate aminotransferase locus, where you actually, we actually had a nice opportunity to investigate this, uh, because in the 1987, we found the gradient. You had a high frequency of this one allele of the aspartate aminotransferase system, high up in the shore. Low in the shore, the frequency was very low of the same allele. But then came a toxic algae bloom that killed all the snails in the low shore. And the high shore snails, they started to move down because there were lots of food for them. And then the, the, you had a dramatic increase in the frequency of the high shore allele. But then over the years that followed, this actually uh, were brought back to more or less original uh, frequencies. So there is a sharp gradient in some uh, pre presumably physiologically related uh, genes over this vertical gradient. And then, of course, if you go back and look again into the, into the uh, inversions and into the SNPs that differentiate the different ecotypes, we, uh, we had the opportunity to actually separate the crab wave uh, dimension from the high-low shore dimension with this uh, pan-European study. Uh, 
And here in this little bit busy graph, you can see that some of the differences are marked in green here. And these are where you find the SNPs that differentiate the crab wave uh, uh, traits. And then you have orange ones showing the low high. And you can actually see that in some inversions here, it's more, more or less the crab wave dimension that is taken care of. While in others, for example, in linkage group nine here, you have more of the high and low uh, variation that is taken care of. So if you do this like a very, very simple uh, simplification, you can say that, well, maybe a few of the inversions are mainly taking care of the crab wave adaptation, while a few other inversions are mainly taking care of the low high shore variation. But this is, of course, not the whole story because it's a little bit more complex. But if you like to make, uh, make this, this easy, you can also say that, OK, and then we have an inversion that takes care of the sex determination. But again, it's a little bit more complex. OK. I, I will actually also tell you, say a few words about a small thing that a little bit is, uh, what do you say, a, par a parallel to, to, to Dolph's ponds there. Dolph, he has, is it 18 ponds or something? Yes. Uh, in the snail system, we have one scary. It's a small scary. It's a small rock in the middle of the sea. You can barely see it. Uh, it's uh, under the red pointer there. And after this uh, toxic algae bloom had killed all the low shore snails, many of these small scaries or small rocks, isolated rocks, were completely emptied of snails. So this is a place where it has originally been wave exposed ecotype. But after the killing, I came there and I put uh, several hundred of uh, crab ecotype instead, just like a funny experiment. But it seemed after some years that they actually survived and they actually started to change. So they actually changed the phenotype and they also changed the genotype. And we are now analyzing this data uh, 30 years later. And it's fascinating to see that what you can do uh, is that if you kind of changed the selection pressure here from crab predation. And then or you replace the crab predation instead by transplanting the snails to another environment. You replace it with wave action. What happens is that over something like 20, 30 generations, they will actually change from one ecotype to the other. And now I'm not presenting the primary data here, but uh, believe me that the story is more or less exactly this. You cannot tell today that the snails that are out on this uh, wave exposed scary was actually originally from a crab population. We can see it in the neutral part of the genome. We can still trace the crab ancestors, but in the part of the genome that are on the selection, we also see this very strong switch. And of course, you can start to think about this in terms of what's going on here. Well, an easy explanation may be too easy, but at least the first uh, explanation is that this standing genetic variation is probably very important in this aspect. Because, of course, even a crab population then are not fixed completely for, for the uh, alleles and for the inversion arrangements that are uh, the, the more, more uh, well, hi hi highly, uh, hi highly selected in the crab environment. But, but they, many of the individuals there are heterozygote and they carry on the variation, they carry with them the variation that is needed to, to build a population in the future of, of uh, the other ecotype. So this is more or less trying now to go back to the original questions. How does reproductive isolation evolve? Well, at least as a consequence of this ecological adaptation, we see a lot of re reproductive isolation. Of course, there is still a question now, will these ecotypes ever be uh, finally two different species? Well, we are not at all sure about this. Because actually what we've done now also the last years is to go out and just pick randomly snails. So just without selecting the typical habitats of wave and crab, we just went randomly. And if you do that, and if you plot the phenotype of the ra randomly picked snails, 
uh, in the first place, you find them in all shores. That was a surprise to me. You, you, you more or less find them everywhere, but always on the shore. You find them in the grass, under the birch trees, in the in, inland, in the protected areas. You find them on the most exposed coast. But if you plot all the phenotypes, it just makes a big swarm. So it's not really an, any subdivision there. So we are in a continuum here. But you can also find this obviously this place is where you have these two ecotypes where, where they come into contact, where the environment is strikingly different and you have these abrupt environmental clients, then you find these very nice hybrid zones and very strong, strong uh, divergence over a few meters only. So ecological adaptation is of course involved here. Can the barriers evolve without isolation? Well, in the case of the snails, it seems like at least the immediate uh, divergence can happen very nicely without any isolation. But on the other hand, we have the old inversions and they can of course have a background where they involved uh, the arrangement uh, evolved different under isolation. We don't know that yet. So there can still be components of allopatry in the background here. But in the primary case, it seemed to go very smoothly to, to just separate them or if the divergent selection is strong enough. And then finally, from where comes the genetic variation? Well, it's obviously so that the standing genetic variation is important and also this organization or, or, or arrangement of inversions, which maintain a lot of, of the suit, suitable uh, alleles for one environment or the other is quite helpful here. And we think that in the case of, of the snails here, this rapid transition from one to another would not have been possible unless we had much of the variation inside these inversions. Then I should point out that it's not all of the, of the variation because we also have divergence, which is important in the collinear regio region, so outside the inversions. Okay, and then by that, I want to thank the collaborators. There are many people involved over the years. And as I said, Roger has been instrumental, of course, also Anja Westram and uh, Rui Faria. And uh, we have uh, also modelers like Marina Rafailovic uh, being involved and many others. So thank you.